Hello, and welcome to the Warren County Community College SUAS Drone Program session. This is class three, part one. This session is on the National Airspace System, the national airspace that is over the United States of America. Throughout uh, class three, we're going to, in the multiple parts, we will go through the NAS, or the National Airspace System. We will also talk about airports and airport markings, airspace classifications, and perhaps even some application of small unmanned aircraft systems. One of the things to realize is to control air traffic, the Federal Aviation Administration has created a classification system for airspace within the National Airspace System. Uh, this classification system uh, is broken down into several levels. Uh, the easiest way to kind of think of it is A, B, C, D, E, and G, airspace. But what do these classifications mean? For drone operators, we know that there is a Class A, and Class A is anything over 18,000 feet mean sea level. In other words, where commercial jets often fly. That high level airspace is no place for drones and they should never be up that high. Uh, we know from past history that there have been drone operators throughout the, the world who have tried to reach that airspace. That is utterly inappropriate because as you remember from the regulations class, you can only go to 400 feet above ground level or 400 feet above whatever you are uh, looking at or using your drone for as long as you stay within a 400 foot radius. So there is no way that a drone should ever be at 18,000 feet mean sea level. Think about this, uh, know that class, class A airspace exists, but also know that you will likely never go there. America's largest airports like Newark, JFK, Dallas-Fort Worth, Dulles, uh, Reagan, these airspaces are going to be Class B airspace. And you can see it there on the screen in what looks like an upside-down wedding cake. So Class e B airspace is the most congested airspace that exists. And likely, as a drone pilot, you will almost never be flying or get permission to fly in Class B airspace. But as you can see, look at the upside down wedding cake. And the way to understand this is look to the ground and you will see what looks like a, kind of a, a partial hash mark. That's really supposed to represent the runways at the bottom. And I'll try to move the mouse there so you can see it now right here. Then you have the lowest circle. Anything here is going to be Class B airspace from what is known as SFC or surface to another uh, level of Class B. Anything over here below this Class B airspace, as long as you're down here, let's say you were actually in Class G, then you're in free and open airspace. So Class B starts at the surface and goes to a certain point. And then its next layer starts at an elevation, and we'll look at some of these in part two, and goes to a certain height, and then another level. These can be rounded circles, but they may be cut off because other airports can be near there in very congested areas. Um, their level of altitude where each layer begins on the upside down layer cake will differ. Uh, by airport, but there are some consistencies and we'll talk about them throughout this course. There is also Class C airspace. So near us, this might be represented by Allentown Airport in the Pennsylvania Allentown area near Warren County Community College. But Class C airspace will be still high level, high congested commercial airspace, but not as congested as Class B uh, and may only in fact have two layers uh, in the upside down wedding cake. Class D is also airspace controlled by the FAA with an airport. You can note that by the uh, runway on the ground, but it'll be more like a cylinder. And there are some 
um, standard uh, sizes for class D, but there's not a second layer or a third layer like in class B. That brings us to class E airspace. Class E airspace is all the airspace around the United States that is not class A, B, C, D, or G. So sometimes this is called everyone's airspace. Uh, this is controlled by air traffic control, as is class A, B, C, and D. So you would need permission to be flying in this area. Class G, which I often try to remark as ground, really represents non-towered airports, uh, uncontrolled airspace, and it can either go as high as 700 feet above ground level or 1,200 feet above ground level, depending on the area. And in fact, in some parts of the country, may reach as high as 14,500 mean sea level. Still, regardless of where you are, you will always be 400 feet above ground level as your regulation, with the understanding that if you're looking at a tower or a large building and you stay within 400 feet radius of that structure, you can go 400 feet above that structure itself. So for the most part, you will be towards the ground with drone operations, and that's the sweet spot for drones uh, anyway. So let's talk a little bit more about this, because I know it can be confusing, especially for non-aviators. The NAS is broken down into two categories, regulatory and non-regulatory. So in other words, those airspaces regulated by the FAA and those not regulated by the FAA. There are four types of airspace, controlled, air traffic controlled, uncontrolled, usually class G, special use airspace, or other airspace, and we'll review those as well. The regulated or regulatory airspace is, again, largely regulated by government agencies, normally the FAA, although there may be some other agencies that uh, regulate and restrict. Uh, for instance, you will find restricted airspace around places like the White House, Camp David, or other highly sensitive government areas that will be restricted or prohibited. Um, we often refer to these as Class A or Class Alpha. You'll hear it said either way. Class B, Class Bravo. Class C, Class Charlie. Class D, Class Delta. Class E, Class Echo, restricted and prohibited. Uh, that is the phonetic language used by airmen, so they will be used interchangeably depending on who you're speaking to. Non-regulatory, or those not regulated necessarily by a federal agency, oh, they may be regulated by the military, would be Class G and the Warren County Community College Drone Port or the Smith uh, Drone Training Center falls within Class G airspace. And we'll kind of cover this in part two. Other areas that are non-regulatory where you can get permission to fly may be a military operation area. You would look at the back of your sectional chart or Google the military operation area, and you would make a phone call and see if you could get permission to uh, operate in that area. There are also warning areas, alert areas, and controlled firing areas. All of these are not necessarily regulated, but for obvious reasons, you'll want to be aware of them in the national airspace system. Those airspaces that are controlled and controlled by air traffic control are classes A, B, C, D, and E. The only airspace that is uncontrolled and relies on visual flight rules for the most part, is Class G airspace. This is where you will spend the vast majority of your time as a drone operator, in Class G airspace. Now, when you're taking your test, these can be difficult to remember. So there is a legend that is provided on sectional charts, and it is included in your Airman Knowledge Testing Supplement. And you can get a copy free at this point. It's the FAA CT8082H, but realize they do update this. So you want to make sure you have the most current version. And Appendix 1 is what I like to think of as that legend that comes with the book that you will have sitting in front of you while you'll take your test. And it can be very, very helpful. So, for instance, you will get information on airports. And they tell you what the symbols mean. 
you'll know whether they're private airports, military airports, helicopter ports, uh, abandoned paid airports, or if they have fuel or other services there, you would be able to tell that. You'll also get airport data in the legend. This will tell you things like where do you find the frequency? Where do you find the common traffic advisory frequency or the Unicom frequency? What is the ATIS frequency? So these are all here. The one you probably want to focus on the most, but most of the questions will come, is the frequency that's next to this letter C. You can see this C indicates common traffic advisory frequency. This is an important frequency to be aware of because you'll be tested on that numerous times. So remembering where to find it on the sectional chart can be very helpful. And if you forget, you have this legend in your test supplement book there for you to take the test. You can also get more information on radio aids to navigation, communication boxes themselves, obstructions, and there will be many test questions on this part. Uh, this would represent towers or a large uh, group of obstructions, whether they have electric or lighting on them. And they will also give you uh, the top number being the mean sea level and then the one in parentheses being above ground level. These can be used interchangeably on the test, but remember from drone pilots, the above ground level is how we fly. Other things that can there is air traffic service and airspace information. So when you're looking at a sectional chart, if you forget what the solid blue line looks like or what it represents, you can, if you're having test anxiety, look at this and say, oh, that's class B airspace. Oh, they call this magenta. You may say that looks red to me, but this is magenta. The solid magenta would be class C airspace. Class D airspace would be dashed blue lines. Class E airspace, which can happen from time to time around airports where they want to control the airspace leading up to normally where someone may be taking off or landing, you can find a magenta dash line. You'll also see these two shaded, uh, shaded magenta, which is what you'll see most of the time. And when you don't see this, it's often think of it as sh the shaded blue, which I have rarely actually seen on a sectional chart, but we'll go over this in part two. You also will get the symbols for prohibited, alert, special airport usage, air defense, national security area, all these different symbols, military training routes, and miscellaneous things that happen at an airport. Are there parachuters there? Is there hang glider activity? All of these things will be there. This little symbol here, which has a name and a flag often represents a high congestion area where, or a mark where manned aircraft would look to develop and visually represent their flight patterns coming into an airport or their takeoff pattern. So if you see this normally on a test for drone pilots, and there, I'm sure there are other uses for this, this often represents a high congested area. In addition to try to help pilots understand where they are, you can see things like major highways, railroads, power transmission lines, uh, theaters, lookout towers, racetracks, all kinds of things may be represented to try to give you that conception of the geography of both the air and the ground. So here's another kind of representation of uh, airspace, and you can see class A, 18,000 feet MSL to 60,000 feet MSL. Class E airspace, all airspace between A and G that isn't B, C, or D. And you can see here this representation kind of shows it on the ground. So the green represents the ground. And you can see Class G exists everywhere next to the ground where there are not cities, large buildings, or uh, controlled airspace, uh, B, C, or D. And then above where Class G ends is always Class E until you get to class A. Now, these aren't always 100%, but for the most part, class D is often small airports surface to 2,500 feet above ground level with a radius around four nautical miles. Class C, lower section radius, about five nautical miles. Upper section radius, normally 10 nautical miles. These are moderately busy, busy airports that go from the surface or the runway to 4,000 feet AGL. These, 
There will always be exceptions to these, but these give you a general idea. Class B airspace, busiest airports near us. The busiest would be the New York City airports, Philadelphia's airport. Um, and that will go from the surface to 10,000 feet AGL. Think of it like this. If you've ever been to the Newark airport on a Friday night, chances are you've been in this section of Class B flying in a circle until they are ready to bring you down a level. You get excited and then you fly in another circle for a while until they bring you down for your ultimate landing. One time I was in this circle so long that they had to fly us from Newark back to Philadelphia to regas the plane so we could get back in the queue and fly the circle again. If you've ever flown Newark on a Friday night, you're familiar with this. So let's remember, Class A airspace, you're not going to be there, but it goes from 18,000 feet MSL to 60,000 feet, includes airspace within 12 nautical miles of the 48 contiguous states. You will not see this on a sectional chart. You cannot find it because it's above, it's where people are flying, it would not see. And UAS or small unmanned aircraft systems are prohibited. Why? Well, you have to keep it within a line of sight. You have to keep it uh, 400 feet. So there is no possible visual flight rules there. So you cannot fly there. Let's talk a little bit about Class B again. This is controlled airspace. There's an aircraft control tower. It extends from the surface to a higher specified altitude. Size, altitudes, and layouts can vary greatly and consist of multiple airports from time to time, especially in a highly congested area. You will find these on the sectional chart, which we'll look at uh, an example of in our next video. And the floor and ceiling are deno denoted with one number over another, or the letters SFC. So for instance, this may be SFC from surface, that's what SFC means, to 2,500 feet. This one might start at 2,500 feet and go to 5,000. This one could start at 5,000 and go to 7,500, 7,500 to 10,000 feet above ground level. Uh, that is how uh, the airspace might work, but we'll look at that a little bit more. If you have your Airman Knowledge Supplement, we would have come with your uh, test 2020 test prep book. You can look at figure 25, and figure 25 is Dallas-Fort Worth, and you can see a large number space and a lot of congestion. All these little magenta circles with what looks like runways are uncontrolled uh, airports. All these blue runways are controlled airports. And you can start to see when you're looking at this, and this is probably why it's one of the test questions. It's like, wow. So here's the, well, actually the inner circle, you can see it's not even a, a clear circle because of all the airports, but you have this kind of inner circle. And you can see at this point, that part goes from SFC, which would be the surface, so from the runway, to the top, which would be, in this case, 11,000 feet above ground level. The next layer will start at 2,000, always add two zeros to the end, and that will be the, the first layer of the layer cake, and it may go to 11,000 feet as well. You can see this one. You get out here and to think of this as those layers, this starts at 3,000 feet and goes to 11,000 feet. And you can look all around. Now, when you take your test, they'll do all kinds of things to you, like name some of these other airports, ask you what, where class B begins, where class uh, C, see here you got 4,000 feet. So you're gonna have to study and go through to, and work the test prep questions in your remote uh, ASA remote test prep book, and it'll get you to where you wanna go. I'll show you a couple other things. You'll notice here that there are in there. Here's your ATIS, your CT. So it's got your radio frequencies. As you can see, this is very, very congested airspace. Difficult to read and often difficult to get uh, air traffic control clearance for drone operations. Uh, it would take a, a special act of, the, of working with the FAA to fly in this area if you needed to. But again, if you're out here, you can go up to 2,000 feet. So you may, in fact, be able to do drone work over here without air traffic control permission. Um, but you'll want to check the sectional charts. You'll want to make sure you're not near another airport over here that goes to the surface. So you need to learn to read these. It's kind of what 
say. Class C airspace, controlled airspace, uh, most share the same dimensions, often two circles, both centered on the primary airport in a radius of five nautical miles, often extends from surface to 4,000 feet, outer shelf 10 nautical miles, and it may extend from another uh, level. As you can see, these are kind of standards that, that they're going over here in this, in this slide, but know that they're going to change every time and you're going to have to read the sectional chart, which we'll go over numerous times. An outer area of 20 nautical miles, uh, pilots are encouraged but not required to start to call in and talk about that they are coming to land at the airport. Uh, if you are going to fly in this area, please do know, not only will you need air traffic control permission, but they're going to want you to have a two-way radio, a transponder, and an encoding altimeter. In case you're not familiar, a transponder, sure it's for transmitter responder, is an electronic device that produces a response when it receives a radio frequency, and aircraft have transponders to assist in identifying them on air traffic control radar. Collision avoidance systems have been developed to use these transmissions as a means of detecting aircraft and limiting risk of collision. The altimeter, normal, but with additional capability for sending a digitized output to the transponder for transmission to air traffic control. So in other words, you need equipment that is going to show up on radar and let planes and air traffic control know where your drone is at all times. So if we were looking at Class E airspace, there's one on figure 20 of your uh, supplement. You need air traffic control. And you may want to look uh, at this in particular, or maybe your local area, your local airport uh, that is Class C to kind of read it. And we'll do that in, a, in, in Section 2 of this class. Class D airspace, generally speaking, and again, these will vary. Uh, from the surface to about 2,500 feet AGL, four nautical mile radius. Each Class D is individually tailored. And in fact, many of them are often very close to a Class C or Class B airport. So they have to be controlled. They will have commercial jets that often take off from them. Uh, but they may not run 24 hours a day like some of the larger airports. So at night, that, in fact, may not be Class D anymore when it closes. But while it is during Class D hours, you must have air traffic control clearance to fly there. You'll see an example of this on figure 78. One of the things I'll kind of remind you of several times during these videos is when you're using the Airman Knowledge Supplement, remember, do not confuse the figure number with the page number. They are not the same, and people get confused from time to time. When you're taking your FAA Part 107, you want to consistently be looking at the figure, not the page number. So in this case, in this Sergeant Bluff, you'll notice here's a nice uh, uncontrolled airport. But this dotted blue line that looks like a circle is surrounds the airport, surrounds the runway, uh, this bracketed line tells you it goes to 3,600 feet, so from the surface to 3,600 feet. So each one of these Class D will have one of these uh, brackets with a number in it. So that 36 is very significant on figure 78 because it tells you the top of the airspace, the altitude where Class D ends and Class E begins until it turns into Class A. And that probably is confusing to you, but again, we'll go over this many times. So, like I was saying, Class D might end, and in that case, it's not 2,500 feet. It was 3,600 feet. And then you go to Class E all the way up until you get to 18,000 feet MSL. So this is Class E we'll talk about now. It's all the airspace between A and the ground, okay, that isn't D, C, or B. So most of the airspace over the U.S. is actually Class E airspace. Okay, Class E can also be start at 14,500 14, MSL in certain areas. And but most places, Class E is either 1,200 AGL starting from the surface or 700 
the AGL. And there is a way to tell this on the sectional chart that we'll go over in the next video. You'll notice, though, that there will be airports. This one around Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho has a wonderful seaplane here. There's a hotel here, that, and these are full of boats, uh, lots of tourists. So although this may be an uncontrolled airport, it is controlled because it has been designated Class E. Class E because for a rural kind of remote area, there is a great deal of tourism here. So they need to control the airspace around this area for safety's sake, because you have seaplanes, private airport, for because this is somewhat of a wealthy area, and you have to control the airspace for the sake of safety. Now, some other things going on around here. This, this is a Vortec. You do not need to worry about this. This is not, this one with the hashes is not airspace. Um, designator for controlled airspace, A, B, C, D, E, or G. But when you're here inside this dashed magenta, you are in class E, you will need air traffic control permission from Spokane to operate. But if you were out here in, let's say, this Twin Lakes area, you're actually now in class G airspace because you're outside of this boundary. So you could fly your drone here, but be aware that you're still within a lot of airports. So they have this shaded magenta that I'm going over here all the way around. So whether you're within this area here, outside the dash, but within the shaded magenta, so let's say Twin Lakes, let's say you were doing a job, you needed to survey something here at the lake or a panoramic view for some client, you can fly up to 700 feet. Once you hit 700 feet, you enter Class E airspace. We know it's 700 feet because of this magenta. Now, if you were all the way out here at Spirit Lake, there is no magenta around this. You're well away from the Class E. You've gone outside of this shaded boundary, and you're here. When there is no boundary in your sectional chart, and we'll go over this more in the next video, then you may go uh, from the ground, because it's Class G airspace, up to 1,200 feet above ground level. So what you're basically seeing here with all these is control of the airspace. Where does E begin? So at Spirit Lake, E begins at 1,200 feet. At Twin Lakes, because you're within this boundary, outside of this Class E boundary, Class E starts at 700 feet. And I know that on the first time hearing this, this can be a little confusing. So we'll go over it some more in future videos. Class E airspace, um, as we said, often begins at either 700 or 1200. So within, if we're at this airport, within this boundary here on figure 24, so if I'm at this airport, it is class G from the runway to 700 feet. At 700 feet in the air, it becomes class E airspace and you would need air traffic control permission. But if you were trying to look at this tower out here in Wolf City, because you're outside of the magenta, shaded magenta area, and you're far enough away from the airport, class E airspace will begin at 1,200 feet. So at this tower, if you were doing this tower, you would be able to fly to the top 309 feet in the air, easily below 400. But if you stay within 400 foot radius of this tower, you could go to 709 feet. You'd get 400 on top of the top of the tower. And at 709 feet, you would not need to call air traffic control because outside of this magenta line, Class G goes from the ground to 1,200 feet. If this tower was within over here in Fairly, then if you went to 709 feet, you would need air traffic control permission because once you hit that 700-foot mark, you would then enter Class E airspace. 
Let's also talk about special use airspace. There are a number of things that we've talked about, prohibited areas, restricted areas, warning areas, military operation areas, also known as MOAs, alert areas, and controlled firing areas, also known as CFRs. A prohibited area is going to stick out. It's going to say the word prohibited often. It's going to have this very pronounced uh, boundary. It will have a P and a number so that we know which, which prohibited area this is. And they have airspace of defined dimensions established for security, other reasons associated with the national welfare. All right. So examples might be the National Mall in D.C. or Camp David, and it's charted as P dash two numbers. It will stick out on a sectional chart. You will be asked questions about this um, that you will need to uh, know the answer for on the test. The restricted areas are hazardous to non-participating aircraft. So they could be, as you see, Camp Shelby. So this can uh, be an area you could is restricted, especially you may be able to get permission to be on there when, if you call and there isn't something going on, but think about it. If they're doing artillery, aerial gunnery or guided missiles and you're flying around there with a drone, that would not be a good day for anyone. So you can only fly here with authorization. Um, and depending on the area, the restricted area, you may or may not be able to get that. You can often see, aside from the very pronounced boundaries, you might often find the word restricted and R a number in a lettering system. Warning areas, again, very well pronounced in the national airspace. They're similar to restricted areas. But often the United States doesn't have sole jurisdiction. So three nautical miles out from the coast of the USA, that contains hazards. So you're getting warnings. These warnings are going to mostly manned aircraft, but you might be out here on a boat. So you would want to be aware. And they're designated to give pilots a warning. And they're usually depicted as a W dash with several numbers, or as you can see here, 237B and low. So it's letting you know uh, that that is a warning area and you should take extra precaution there. Military operation areas, again, very well pronounced. Contact information is available online or on your sectional chart. These are airspace with defined vertical and lateral limits established to separate specific training activities. Uh, those flying with instrument flight rules can travel with ATC clearance. Uh, they're often named but not numbered on the visual flight rule charts or the VFR sectional charts. And you should look around in your testing supplement to see if you can find any of those areas on the charts that they provide to you. An alert area is depicted on an aeronautical chart with an A-2 numbers usually trying to tell you about high volume training areas or unusual uh, aerial activities. So look at figure 20. What type of special operation areas can you find? Here I want to remind you that when you're using your sectional charts and you're using your test supplement, it is really important to familiarize yourself with every sectional chart on your supplement. These are the only ones the FAA can test you on during the test because the supplement is what they refer you to while you're taking your test. So there's no reason to go out and memorize every sectional chart of everywhere in the United States. You want to become familiar with what the various symbols mean. But you also want to realize when preparing for the test, you can only be tested on the charts that are within front of you, and those are the ones found in your testing supplement. So let's remember there are other airspace areas, and we'll go over these in the course, throughout the course, and they may be local airport advisories. They may be military training routes. There might be what's known as a temporary flight restriction, and we'll go over some examples of that. You may get parachute jumps, VFR routes, terminal radar service area, a national security area, air defense zones, and flight restricted zones. And these become more and more frequent. Uh, with every iteration of sectional charts as more and more drones become prevalent in the United States. 
So a military training route, and you can often see these on a sectional chart, they're demoted often by an IR or a VR. All right, so meaning instrument flight rules or visual flight rules, followed by a number. Military training routes with segment above 1,500 feet, AGL, are identified with four numbers. So this one only has three numbers. So MTR with one or more segments above 1,500 feet are identified with three numbers. So be aware that they're giving you indications of these and how low or high they would be flying. Often because they're training routes, there could be very, very uh, quick moving jet airplanes that you would never be able to get out of the way of. So they're on the sectional chart so that manned aircraft and unmanned aircraft is familiar with them. Now, another thing you may not be aware of anymore, but you may be aware of if you're trying to fly in a particular area, especially if you're flying with a DJI drone, okay, that they have put up a number of what we call geofenced areas, computerized areas, geographically based, where your drone, the propellers may not turn, it may not take off, it may refuse to fly. Not all drones do this. DJI had to do this because a member of the national security team went out on his balcony one night in near the D.C. area and landed a phantom on the White House lawn. It wasn't intentional. Just again, when drones first came out, people didn't realize often that they had they, they suffered from flyaways or other uh, mishaps. They've gotten a lot better, but you still always want to be careful and cautious. You are flying an unmanned aircraft, and you certainly do not want your aircraft to land on Washington, D.C. Uh, on the White House lawn. Now, there are means of getting permission to fly within these geofenced areas, but they may take special uh, TSA approvals, uh, Secret Service approvals, etc. So for the most part, if you're in following yourself within one of these invisible barriers, they're prohibited. And if you've updated your firmware, your drone may not operate. There are ways of unlocking your drone, but those require either air traffic control permission or permission from other government agencies. The FAA will release temporary flight restrictions, which often will ground most aircraft. Okay, so in the event of a hazard, it may not let you fly over a octa volcano, for example. Uh, and then it, when there's disaster relief after a major hurricane, they, there may be people flying drones there, but they may not let other aircraft there. So they're going to have restrictions on who can fly there. Uh, if there's an instance of unsafe congestion because of sightseeing, uh, think Super Bowl. Don't want a lot of aircraft flying over the Super Bowl that shouldn't be there. You're going to see TFRs. Natural disasters in Hawaii. VIP to protect the president, the vice president, or other public figures. These are the probably the most common TFRs you're going to find and provide safety for space agency operations. So if a shuttle or a spacecraft is being launched, they're not going to let aircraft fly over that area. So these are really important uh, and you can look them up and you should always look for TFRs. So why do we issue them? Why does the FAA issue them? Well, protect public figures. If there's an imminent flight hazard, if they need to clear the airspace for disaster relief, or other uh, usage to prevent unsafe congestion of aircraft and to provide safe environment for space agency operations. Any of these could be the answer to that question. How would you check for notice to airmen? And notice to airmen could be uh, notice about hazards at, that may even have temporary flight restrictions. So where would you find these? And the answer for drone pilots is 1-800-WX-BRIEF.COM if you go here. And I highly suggest you set up an account with 1-800-WX-BRIEF. And you can look up TFRs all around the country. And we'll go over that in a, in a subsequent class or video. So let's, re let's re recap. Class A airspace, it exists. It will not be on a sectional chart. You do not need to worry about it because you shouldn't be flying a drone there. Class B, C, D, or E, you may not operate a small on an aircraft. Any of these three airspace or four airspace classifications without proper authorization of air traffic control. And there are limitations even within some of them, even if you do get air traffic control, you may need specialized equipment to fly here. For the most part, 
for most of your time as a drone pilot, you will fly in this nice, safe, yellow area called Class G uncontrolled airspace, whose upper limit will vary, but most of the time in the continental United States will either either end at 700 or 1,200 feet, which will be denoted on the sectional chart. And one last thought. Remember, in every commercial uh, unmanned aircraft operation, there must be a remote pilot in command. They must be designated before each flight. But if you have two licensed pilots and one becomes tired or needs to leave, you can change who's in command. But there must always be one person in command. And every remote pilot in command can only operate one drone at a time legally under the law at this point. Thank you. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video.